Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes finding quality candidates simple. With one click, post your job to 100 leading job sites across the web and manage your candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash modern. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash modern. Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. How do we choose what to hold on to from loved ones after they've died? Doris Yarovich asks that question in her essay, On a Serpentine Road with the Top Down. It's read by Michelle Rodriguez, who starred in the Fast and Furious movies, Avatar and Lost, among others. You can see her alongside Viola Davis in the new movie, Widows. The skies opened up as I watched the tow truck winch my teal Alfa Romeo onto the flatbed. The 30-year-old convertible again refused to run. And as I dried the rain off my arms, I thought it was probably time to get rid of it. My husband loved the spider, which our kids named the happy car. But before he succumbed to melanoma at 48, He specifically instructed us not to make the car a shrine. I held on to it anyway. I rarely drive it. I had intended to use it to teach our kids to drive stick shift, but that never happened. I couldn't bear them grinding those gears. The downpour ended the moment the tow truck left. Steam rose from the driveway and refracted the sudden sunshine. It was a sign, I told myself. Time to let go. I tried to ignore the immediate heaviness against my breastbone. The Alpha had to be towed 25 miles to a specialist shop. Years earlier, I upgraded my AAA membership to cover this recurring expense. I called the shop to describe the car's current symptoms. The mechanic, who knows both the car and me, said, You can't just let it sit. A car like that, you need to either drive it or sell it. (laughs) You'd think I'd be an expert in letting go by now. I let go of the notion that my family could be happy only if it included my husband, with whom I had shared every thought and feeling and plan for 20 years. I let go of a different happy family configuration when our daughter, then our son, left for college. Though I dreaded the moment when both children would leave, I also saw how ready they were For them, letting go of one thing meant making room to grab a hold of an entire universe. And even apart, we remained close. We didn't just survive, but found ways to thrive. I let go of many other preconceived notions about how my life would play out when I forced myself to start dating again, a few years after my husband's death. When I sat through meals with strangers whose tales of misery and love snuffed my appetite. Each week in yoga, I obediently left my limbs go heavy when the teacher says, begin to practice the art of letting go. Why then is it so difficult for me to let go of this car? 
Part of the answer came a few weeks later, when on a cloudless September afternoon, I retrieved the alpha from the shop. I was appalled at the bill and began composing for sale ads in my head. But as I drove, the breeze warmed my cheeks. The swamp sunflowers popped in yellow clusters that I'd failed to notice from the confines of my sensible sedan. There was still a hint of honeysuckle in the air. I downshifted, and the car hugged the clover leaf coming off the highway. The motor hummed. The seat embraced me, both hands, both feet, my entire body, all engaged. No fiddling with the cell phone or radio. Just me and the car and the road. I was transported to the fall day in Vermont when my husband taught me to clutch and shift in a different convertible on another serpentine road. I was studying for medical school exams. We had no money, but we splurged on a bed and breakfast. That was how he was. Hardship didn't stop him from plunging into things he loved. In the early days, an unreliable car was our only means of transportation. We eventually added a safer car, but how our daughter beamed when her dad drove her to school in the spider. How the second grade boys mobbed the convertible in the pickup lane. No airbags, no roll bar, metal bumpers, an open top. A bad idea to send a child off like that. I was the kind of mom who put helmets on our kids when they learned to ice skate. But my daughter wrote a poem about the light filtering through the trees as she and her dad flew through those moments in time. My daughter and son have grown into people who immerse themselves in the world via all their senses. The Alpha is impractical, costly and inconvenient. My hair becomes a bird's nest when I drive with the top down. When it rains, the fabric roof pings the cold drops onto my head. It has left me stranded more than once. And I love it. I was raised to set aside my aspirations to be a writer because the winding path of a creative career seemed lined with risk and destitution. And my immigrant family had had enough of that. Better to cut loose the impractical and hold tight to the tangible certainties my parents advised. My husband, raised in similar circumstances with similar expectations, somehow flouted the conventional notion of what was worth holding on to or throwing away. He became a scientist instead of a doctor and found not only creative fulfillment but financial success in that less predictable career path. His grad school student loans partly subsidized flying lessons. And he later flew me to Ocracoke, North Carolina, in a twin-engined Cherokee warrior landing on the grass strip beside the shimmering beach, extinguishing the fear of flying I'd developed aboard much safer commercial jets. He took safety seriously. We delayed flying back if the weather turned. He didn't take foolish risks, but he inspired reasonable risks. He encouraged me to keep writing and working part-time as a physician, even if it meant it would take us longer to repay student debt. He left letters for our kids, urging them to refrain from bitterness or fear because of his fate. Remain open to the vast beauty around you, he told them. Engage. And when your mom meets someone new, as I hope she will, try to be open to him. I did meet someone new a few years ago and had to let go in a host of unexpected ways. My partner has four children, two younger than mine, and two former wives. His children have lost not a parent, but something potentially more destabilizing. Their faith in the possibility of deep love. Some children carry into adulthood the fervent wish that their divorced parents will somehow reunite. 
poisoning their ability to find joy in the actual relationships that surround them. My partner recognizes the difficulties. Early in our relationship, he questioned why I would take on the baggage of his past life. Baggage he has often wished he could jettison. Not the children, of course, but the painful dynamics of the adults around them. My husband used to say, if it was easy, it would be done. Driving my Alfa Romeo reminds me that difficulty, per se, has never stopped me from pursuing something I think has true worth. Driving, I'm reminded that I, too, can shift gears, face risk, handle inconvenience, and survive tragedy. I re-experience the joy in all my senses. Touch, smell, taste, hearing, and not exclusively vision, as dictated by our increasingly virtual world. I'm forced to disengage. I can't return calls, eat lunch, and drive to the office all at once. Without anti-lock brakes, I scan the road ahead more mindfully. The car may look zippy, but any soccer mom in a sealed air-conditioned six-cylinder Land Rover can easily overtake me. It's not the speed, but the journey, I tell myself. I continue to write, even if my day job means it takes me half a decade to finish a book. And my partner and I press onward, doing our work individually and together to address the losses we've had. To build something together that is strong enough to withstand both nostalgia and anger. As I consult various people on whether to sell the car, it becomes a litmus test. My in-laws say, simplify. You have so much to manage. My kids are sad but accepting. They're moving around the country now with college, internships, and jobs, and although they love the car, they're a little afraid to sit in the driver's seat, to be reminded of too much, and perhaps to be compared. My partner, eyes misting, says, You love that car. And your husband was an extraordinary man. He says, I feel so lucky that we're together. And so sad that you too couldn't be. He says, Keep fixing it. I'll drive it with you anytime. Maybe the trick is knowing when to let go and when to hang on. That's Michelle Rodriguez reading Doris Yarovich's essay on a serpentine road with the top down. We'll catch up with her and learn what happened to the Alfa Romeo after the break. Modern Love is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. You know what's not smart? The way hiring used to be. Job sites that overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. Now there's a smarter way at ZipRecruiter.com modern. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds the right people for you and actively invites them to apply. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S., and right now, Modern Love listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash modern. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-O-D-E-R-N. So did Doris Yarovich keep the Alfa Romeo? 
I did keep it for, uh, really it ended up being just a few months after the piece came out. And then I was in the midst of moving to Boston and it broke down. And so I took it into the shop and sort of left it there. I moved, the car stayed, I paid to have it repaired, thought that I might bring it up here, and then it became increasingly clear that it would be a very difficult city to have a car like that. And so um, it took me actually another two and a half years before I was ready to sell it, but I did actually just sell it a couple of months ago. And the buyer has actually kept in touch with me and is intending to teach his teenage son to drive a stick shift with the car. So that's exciting and I think a good home for the car. Doris says that when she sold the car, there was sadness, but also relief. There is certainly part of me that wishes I could have kept it forever. And I think that if logistically I could do it and financially it wasn't a constant drain, I would have done that. It's a great car and I think It both connects me to my late husband, but it also contains a piece of me that is harder to express in other ways. So the kind of carefree, cool, and also maybe not so easy to drive (laughs) um, vehicle is a reflection, I think, of qualities that I had when I was younger and that I value in myself and that are harder to find ways to express as I get older. And she says that as time has passed, the way she deals with the loss of her husband has changed. And I think in the immediate aftermath of losing him, there was this very intense fear that somehow we would forget him. And as the years go by and it's clear that, of course, you forget, I think you forget the small things, but the big things remain. And I think as I've become more secure in that knowledge, it's become easier to let go of the physical objects that embodied parts of him. And Doris is still in the relationship she writes about in her piece. Being in a new relationship after having lost someone that you really care about is difficult. And also it's very reassuring that it's possible, that it's still possible. And so I think I felt very grateful to discover that I was still capable of feeling love in that way for someone else. And is she done with quirky Italian cars? There is part of me that thinks, at some point in my life, I'm going to get another one, maybe with less rust in the undercarriage. (laughs) You know, certainly if I move to a warmer climate again, I would consider it pretty seriously. Or I might get a different kind of cool convertible. (laughs) That's Doris Yarovich. She's a psychiatrist living in Boston, and she's just finished a novel and is at work on a memoir. We've got more after the break. What happens when you listen into more than 140,000 different communities? Made up of 330 million users? You hear a lot of stories. I'm Amory Sievertson. I'm Ben Brock Johnson, and we are from Endless Thread, the show featuring stories found in the vast ecosystem of online communities called Reddit. Every week, we tell a different story, from mattress industry conspiracy theories... To jellyfish stings that bring victims a sense of doom, and even a serial killer that may have saved jazz music. Subscribe to Endless Thread thread wherever you get your podcasts. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. What I liked about Doris's essay is, you know, she goes through this horrible premature death of her husband, and she's left in this place of, how do I move on? Do I want to move on? What do I hold on to? And we're sort of filled with bromides about how you handle these situations and people will say to you, oh, you have to move on and you have to let go and you shouldn't invest in inanimate objects and all of that. And I find that we have to sort of navigate those expectations and those feelings of attachment against sort of a one-size-fits-all of how to grieve. Next week, Stanley Tucci. 
The first time in my life I had unprotected sex, one August night three summers ago, I was 45. No pill or condom, no diaphragm or IUD. None of the sundry devices deployed to keep me careering childless through a quarter century of romance with women I had lusted after and sometimes loved. This time, the woman was my wife, Molly, and we had decided to have a baby. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, and John Parati. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. See you next week.